and welcome dear students. Today our topic for deliberation is gender, family and household of ancient India between 300 BC to 300 CE. The main objectives of this lecture are to know about the status of gender as reflected in various traditions, to know about the family system, to know about the patriarchal system and finally to know about the institution of marriage. The micro level political, economic and the social transformations of the time were linked to the changes at the family and household levels. Changing times required a shift in ethics. The patrilineal transmission of property and the preservation and perpetuation of the endogamous caste structure required stringent control over women's sexuality and the reproductive capacity. Strengthening patriarchal power within the household and emphasizing certain marriage and chaste roles were the means through which the control was achieved. Buddhist and the Jain writings suggest ideal behavior for monastic and the layman. However, the Brahmanical Dharma Sutras and Graha Sutras represent the most complete and the systematic effort to authoritatively define and governing social ideals and customs. Given the importance of grahastha, that is the household stage in this tradition, this is not surprising. Whether we are examining Brahmanical or Buddhist literature, we must distinguish between the ideal condition depicted in them and the actual situation that exists during their time. This means going against the grain and reading between the lines. The household may also comprise their unmarried children, their married sons and their families, the husbands, parents, slaves and the servants. There are three terms for the household unit, that is Kutamba, Graha and the more common Kula. The Kulapati was the head of the family, whereas Kulapata refers to the junior males. While the household remains the core unit of agricultural labor, paid laborers and to a lesser extent slaves increasingly complemented household labor. The institution of marriage was fundamental to the householder's existence. In Buddhist teachings, the most favored sort of marriage is the one in which the bride and the groom are younger and chaste and were arranged by their parents. There are references to Ahava, which means the bride's family and Vivaha meaning the leading away referring to the groom's family. It's unknown if Ahava and Vaha were two separate ceremonies or the same one. The Vinaya Patika describes types of unions between a man and a woman. When a woman is brought with the money, that is known as Danakta. When she voluntarily stays with a man, that's known as Chandavasani. When a man gives her money, that's known as Bhogavasani. When a man gives her cloth, when she takes off her headgears, that's known as Upta Chambata. When she is also a female slave, that's known as Dasinama. When she is also a servant, that's known as Kamakari. When she is temporarily with a man, that's known as Mohatika. And when she is taken prisoner in a raid, that's known as Dahajata. Except for the Chandavasani union, all other involved either an economic exchange or the women's previously subservient position. The reference to union including the purification of water and the removal of bride's headgears suggests the performance of a ritual. There are eight categories of the marriage mentioned in the Dharma Sutras that is Brahma Viva, Divya Viva, Arsha Viva, Prajapatiya Viva, Gandhava Viva, Asura Viva, Rakshasa Viva and Pishkasa Viva. The Samritis expand on this theme. The Brahma marriage is one in which a father presented his daughter to a good-hearted Vedic educated man after dressing her up and honoring her with clothing and decorations. The Divya marriage occurs when a parent dresses and honors his daughter with jewelry and clothing before giving her in marriage to a priest performing the sacrifices. Only Brahmanas are subjected to this form. To accordance with customary law, not as a sale of the daughter, the Arsha forms allow for a gift of a daughter in exchange for a pair of kettles, 
which includes a cow and a bull are two pairs. In a Prajapati marriage, the father presents the bride to be after blessing the groom with the proper rituals such as Mudhu Parika and saying to the couple, may both of you perform your religious duties together. In Osura marriage, the bridegroom gives the bride and her family as much money as he can manage before the father of a bride gives the daughter away. Gandava kind is a union based on shared love and concern between a man and a woman. The Rakshasa kind occurs when a woman is forcibly taken from her house and her family members are frequently slain or brutally assaulted. When a male engages in sexual activity with a woman while she is in sleep of drunk, unconscious or mentally unstable, that is known as Pishkasa marriage. The several kind of unions were classified in descending order of property and not all of them received the Samritikara sanction. Pishacha was regarded as the lowest and the Brahma as the best. The later three types are actually more like partnership where women were gained in various ways and were meant to be followed by marriage rites than actual marriage. The Dharma Sutra's categorization of marriage into several types raised the possibility that different marriage customers such as dowry and bride price are common. The early Dharma Sutras advocate for marrying of girl as soon as they reach puberty. According to Gautama Dharma Sutra, a parent commits sin if he does not make sure of this. And a girl should wait three months after she began menstruating before finding her own marriage. The Budayana Dharma Sutra advises a father to give his daughter in marriage to a man without virtue rather than keeping her at home after she reaches puberty. The discussion of the samaskara in nearly every Graha Sutra starts with the ritual associated with marriage. The rites vary greatly in both quantity and the order. Even the Vivaha Sakta verses, a late Rigvedic hymn, have been changed and not all of them are used. The wedding customs reflected a variety of crucial connections, not just between husband and wife, but also throughout their extended family. The groom holding the bride's hand and pointing to the pole star are only a few of the rituals that have various significance. The main ceremony was now presided over by the priest and was held in the girl's parents' house. There were many facets to the husband-wife connection such as sexual attraction, friendship, mutual support, as well as wife's submission to her husband. According to Apastamba Graha Sutra, customs developed by women could be applied to marriage rituals. Although not specifically mentioned, these procedures were obviously significant enough to be mentioned. The Graha Sutra explained various other household rites of passage in addition to marriage. Systematizing them and providing them a sound Brahmanical foundation by emphasizing the importance of Brahma priests and the close relationship between the Grahapati and domestic fire. In the early Dharma Sutra, widow remarriage is disapproved. However, they define the number of years a woman has been abandoned must wait before remarrying. In the list of sons, both Gotama and Budayana included Punharbiva, which means son of a woman who had remarried. Early Samritakaras vivid Nehoga, the traditional practice of a widow cohabiting with her brother-in-law or another man in order to produce offsprings with reluctance. Gotama examines several perspectives on the subject and recognizes sons born via Nehoga listimate hairs. Budayana, on the other hand, asserts that the son belonged to the one who sowed the seed, and hence women must avoid having sexual intercourse with males other than their husbands. This text deemed Nayoga union and their progeny to be sinful. The emphasis on the Pancha Mahayajana was a reflection of the process of defining and remaking rituals. These are addressed in the later Vedic writings but their significance increases 
and they are now referred to as requirement for the brahmanas the five mahayajanas were bhuta yajana which means offering offer to all beings divya yajana which means offering made into the fire pitra yajana which means offering to the ancestors and the manush yajana that is the studying and teaching of the vedas means honoring guests they were to be carried out by the householder alone without the assistance of priest unlike the shudra sacrifices they first seem to have vivid as a means of a man performing his obligations to the many beings in the universe later dharma shastra texts explain them as an atonement for harm and death inflicted upon various being as a result of routine household chores such as using a hearth a mortar a pestle a broomstick and winnowing basket or a water jar it is interesting to note that these mahayajanas were merely figurative yajanas in reality they were modest ceremonies carried out by the householder the dharma shastras examination of the law governing marriages inheritance and the standard of purity and the impurity to be upheld among the kings following a death was centered on sapinda connections marriage between sapinda is prohibited per brahmanical texts all varnas even shudras were intended to be subject to this restriction according to the kane later dharma shastra texts offer various interpretations on the term spinda one theory holds that the spindas are related because they share particles from the same body because the father's body parts are passed on to the son and then to the son and son father son and grandson all are spindas because the mother's bodily parts are still present in the son they are also spinda relatives a person has spinda ties with his mother's father sister and brother if we follow the same logic further because they give birth to a son using their bodies a husband and wife are called as spindas brothers wives are known as spindas because they give birth to a son through their husbands who share the same body that is their father after a certain predetermined number of generations marriage between the members of spinda circuit are not permitted the spinda circuit is defined by law givers like yajna vilkani as having five ascending and descending generations on the mother's side and seven ascending and descending relations on the father's side however other law makers had different view points on the number of degrees of kinships and the specific point at which the line separating permissible marriage from those of unpermissible ones sexual connections with the uterine relations that is mothers and sisters of one's parents and their offspring are invocably prohibited by the upstamba dharma sutra this would prohibit a man from being married to his maternal uncle or paternal aunt's daughter however the same text continues by stating that one of the traditional practices of the south is to marry one's maternal uncle's daughter or paternal aunt's daughter according to budayana persons who engage in similar practices in other regions such as north india committed sin giving the practice in the south an implicit acceptance other samriti karas on the other hand prohibited cross cousin marriage regarding less of the location or cultural context this implies that different regions have different marriage traditions and the samriti karas disagreed on whether or not to recognize them during this period both monogamous and the polygamous marriages were prevalent according to visheshta dharma sutra a brahmana is allowed to have three wives a kshatriya with two and vaishya or shudra just one the story of mahagovinda who when he wanted to abandon the world volunteered to surrender his 40 wives to another man if they desired so suggested the possibility of divorce and remarriage under some circumstances they turned him down and chose to go down the route of renunciation in a state women who committed adultery faces harsh punishments in the vinaya pitaka 
a Lichwinia man seeks the approval of other clan members before killing his adulterous wife. There were patriarchal marriages. The early Graha Sutra have a lot to say about how family members interacted with one another. The Grahapati, which means householder, served as the nucleus and head of the family unit. The family was necessary for both procreation and to pay back the debt the householder owned to his ancestors. According to Jaya Stagi's study, the women was viewed as having both productive and harmful potentials within the family. She might be the one who exterminates Pati, which means husband, animalus means Pushu, and Praja means progeny. She is also the child bearer for her husband's offspring, which means Jaya. This is the most common title. On the subject of whether or not the wife could perform out the graha means domestic ceremonies, the texts differ. According to some Graha Sutra, a woman is capable of performing out rituals like the morning and evening offerings in the domestic fire. But for the large sacrifices, she was unable to act on her own as Yajmana. The widower was intended to burn their domestic fire to cremate the wife when she passes away. When he got remarried, he was supposed to start a fresh fire. When a woman's husband passed away, according to texts like the Aswalyan Graha Sutra, she had to lie on the prayer but should be dragged away from it by brother-in-law or certain other male before it was lit. This represented her readiness to go with her spouse to hereafter. Similar rituals are documented in the Atharveda but still had a place among the living. The development of private land ownership had profound impact on the composition and functioning of the family. Property inheritance became an important subject. It was patrilineal to inherit, according to Buddhist texts. Sons typically shared the property of their parents. When there was no son, either the state or the next of the kin inherited the property. The mother of Sudhana Kalandaka pleaded her son who was converted to Buddhism in the Vinayapitaka to have a child or otherwise the family estate will pass to the Lichwinas. According to Samyukta Nikaya, King Prasanjit acquired the estate of his Sithi, Grahapati, who passed away without leaving any male heirs. The deceased man in her turns appeared to have withheld from his wives and daughters. Buddhist writings mention the possibility of a father occasionally transmitting his property during his lifetime to his son or another class male relative. King has compiled and analyzed the Dharma Shastra ideas on inheritance rights, particularly those of women. Sons were generally given preference over all other male heirs in general. The Buddhayana Dharma Sutra lists the main group of inheritors of a man's property as being his brothers, son, grandson, and great grandson from a woman of the same Varna. The Apastamba Dharma Sutra indicates that in the event that a son is unable to inherit the property, it should be given to the close to Spinda. While the daughter is mentioned, the wife is not included as a potential heir. According to Gautama, a person's wealth should pass to his Sipindas, Sagotras or wife if they are not his heirs. The daughter's claim typically came after the wife. The later Dharma Shastras frequently forbid the wife from inheriting her husband's property or imposing chasteness requirements before she could do so. The Samriti Karas did, however, Acknowledge that a woman did have right over one type of property known as Sitridana. Sitridana, which means the women's property, specifically referred to a few unique type of transportable property granted to a lady on various occasions throughout her career. These included gifts like jewelry, clothing, household items, etc., presented by her parents at the time of their marriage, as well as other gifts from her family, like father, brother, etc. While there were some differences between the Dharma Shastra scriptures 
or the degree to which Satridana was to be regarded as a woman's permanent property. They all agreed that it should be handed from mother to daughter. It's not surprising that the preference for son or daughter continued given the household increasingly patriarchal system. The son was regarded as essential for carrying out the father's funeral ceremonies, appeasing the ancestors and maintaining the lineage. According to Dighanikaya, fathers desire son because they increase the family material wealth, preserve the family line, inherit the father's property and honor his ancestors. According to Vinaya Pitika, people said that the Buddha had destroyed the families by rendering them sonless. In the Samyukta Nikaya, it is mentioned that the Buddha informs the Kosala king Prasanjit, who is disturbed over the birth of a girl. A female child, he tells the king, may prove an ever better offspring than a male one. For she may grow up wise and virtuous. She will honor her mother-in-law and be faithful to her husband. The boy she may bear may do great deeds. The ideal of womanhood are reflected in these statements. We must also keep in mind that the renunciant orders such as Buddhism give both men and women an alternative to the household lifestyle. It is essential to keep in mind that the social customs must have varied greatly by social groups, regions and the location. Dharma Shastra recognizes the three Dharma sources that is Shruti, Simriti and Sadachara or Shishishtachara, which means the custom. In fact, the Buddhayana Dharma Sutra clearly refers to South and North specific practices. Mentioned, Southern traditions included eating with an uninitiated person, that is, one who had not undergone the sacred thread ceremony, eating with one's wife, eating stable food, and marrying the daughter of maternal and paternal uncle or aunt. Northern customers included dealing in wool, drinking alcohol, selling animals with teeth in upper and the lower jaws, following the arm trade and sailing. The text states that custom should be considered authoritative for these practices. However, it's not permissible to follow these practices in place where they are not customary. However, it also states that the lawgiver Gautama disagreed and considered all of these southern and the northern practices to be contrary to the tradition of the Shishisthas, which means the learner Brahman, and as a result, unlawful everywhere. It's also important to keep in mind that these texts typically inform us of the customers and the standards of the upper classes of the society. For example, the samaskaras of the Dharma Shastra explicitly exclude the Shudras. Now, dear students, let's throw some light upon gender in family life, interpersonal relationships. A detailed examination of Buddhist and the Jain literature provides glimpses of interpersonal and gender dynamics in married life. There was conjugal love and the affection between the couples. Sometimes a wife's commitment to her husband is motivated by obligations rather than love. Still a woman's husband values her more than her other relatives. According to the Sigalo Vada Sutta, a husband should treat his wife with respect, kindness, fidelity. In return, she must be hospitable and chaste, talented and dedicated at work and must protect her husband's property. In another passage, Buddha advises young women who are preparing to enter their husband's home. A wife wakes before her husband and is the last to retire, she readily assists him carries out his requests and converse with him in a cordial manner. She reveres and respects everyone whom her husband reveres, including his parents, samanas and brahmanas. She manages the household and its members. She is skillful and nimble in the domestic skills of her husband and she knows how to get the job done and how to be it herself. 
she protect her husband's possessions. The Buddha adds that only such a wife can reborn as a deva after death. In another case, Buddha advises Sujata, the disobedient daughter-in-law of wealthy Anath Pindika. He asserts that there are seven categories of wives, some of which are acceptable and others which are not. The first is the slayer, which is known as Vadika, who is cruel, wicked, neglected by husband at night and spends her time with other people. The second type is the thief, also known as Chori Samha, who steals his money and wishes to reduce him to poverty. The third is mistress like wife, known as Aya Samha, who is lethargic, indolent, costly to maintain, loves gossip and speaks with a loud voice. She diminishes her husband's zeal and diligence. These three nasty and mistrustful individuals reside in hell after death. The fourth type, however, is the mother-like woman known as Muttu Samha, who shows compassion for her husband, treats him as if he were her only son and protects his property. The fifth category is the sister-like, Bagni Samha, a woman who respects her husband as she would be a superior. The sixth type, the companion-like, is delighted at seeing her husband exactly as one would be upon seeing a long lost friend. The final form is the slave-like woman, known as Dasi Sama, who has no fear of her husband's beating and is calm, patient and submissive. These spouses are virtuous and will spend eternity in heaven. Surprisingly, Sujata accepts to be a slave-like wife after hearing Buddha's advice. So dear students, it was all about today's lecture regarding gender, family and household. Hope you have understood it well. See you next time with a new topic. Till then, take care. Goodbye.